First interview with Tilly Moo. Tilly, how long have you been a Moo for? When did you first realise you were a complete Moo? Okay, that's fine. Excellent screen test, Tilly Moo. Hi guys, it's Nick here from Hidden Valley Bushcraft and today we're going to be doing something slightly different. We're going to be answering some of your questions. So Louise has prepared me, okay, I've got a couple of sheets here, I think I've got 15 questions in all to go through to today for our first ever q and I'm going to go through them in, in no particular order. I'm going to address some of the bits and pieces that we've noticed throughout the various videos that we've put up and questions that you at home are asking. Question number one is from Mr. NK. Okay, and it was about four weeks ago, and the question was, is regular hogweed found in gardens poisonous? And the answer is, yes, it can be. Anybody can have an allergic reaction to just about anything, but more so, certain families and genuses, in particular the Apiaceae carrot family, some people have been known to react to uh, regular hogweed in much the same way as, as giant hogweed in that when it goes on your skin it can cause you to blister horribly and it can make you photo or light sensitive and your, your skin will, uh, will feel that for years till it possibly comes back to normal. Okay, so that's, that's number one. Hopefully that's answered that. Sean Mitchell, three weeks ago. What's your view on DD Superlight tarps? Compared to normal tarps, as half the weight and the pack size, I have an injured shoulder and I can't carry the weight in the same way anymore. I've been looking at lighter options just to keep going out and about. Right, okay, so Sean, one thing I would always, always, always say is, if you're gonna save weight, do so, but never compromise your bedding or your shelter system. The fact that it's DD we're talking about here is a well reputed company, um, they're well known for making high quality gear. If they're creating a super light tarp that is half the weight of their other products then you can be reassured that it is probably a quality item. You know my views guys on, on traveling super light, okay so travel light generally freeze at night. That's not to say that's always the case. Okay, hi Nick, what about backpacking uh, light honey stoves? Right, this one's come from Stephen Masters or well, Stefan Masters, about three weeks ago. Okay, what about those lightweight honey stoves? The ones I'm talking about here are the super lightweight construction. They all slot inside themselves. They're usually made of thin steel or titanium, if you can get them in titanium. And you can either use a Trangia stove in them, or they'll also take those hexamine block, those little military hexamine block uh, burners that you can put in there, or you can maybe even put some gel in there. They are fiddly to put together, this person has gone on to say, but they can cook and you can also run them on twigs or whatever else you can find lying around. So I like them and I think they have a place, is my answer here. Whether you're going fishing, whether you're going out for the day, whether you're into photography, wildlife photography, whether you're into whatever kind of lightweight setup you wanna go and take one of these with you, whether you're going off trekking in the hills, obviously being a box, it's kind of windproof and it's quite handy. So yeah, my answer is I think they definitely are good and they definitely have a place. What's the best sleeping mat? Okay, so Hannah Jensen, two weeks ago, what's the best sleeping mat? Difficult one. Terrain, environment, yeah, the country you're in is going to have its own, you know, weather systems or, or a dry season or a wet season or here in the UK where we get that lovely horrible mix of just about everything. I'm going to go and, hey, and say if I was looking for the best as in the highest quality or well-made gear, there is a company called Exped. They do a couple of types of, of down mat. Now, I know this not because I own one myself, but because people I know whose version of reality I trust, okay, so I'm talking about people like my friend Sam over at Monkey Mountaineering, and he would always say to me, uh, as a company called Exped, okay, Exped do a synthetic mat, I think it's called the Synmat Ultralight, okay, that's uh, one that he's currently using, okay, and he is a professional mountaineer. The other one is the Down Mat, okay, the Down Mat 7 Lightweight is another very good one. I tend to use British classic military roll mats, we've got a load of those. They are pretty bomb proof. Anything that's going to survive Dartmoor in the winter, okay, when you're pretty much lying in a tactical, what should we call it, a tactical puddle, because that's what it is guys, a tactical puddle. You're basically lying in a, in a 
bowl shape in the ground that's filling up with water, okay, and um, your roll mat is the only thing that's saving you between the harsh, cold, sapping qualities of the ground, your Gore-Tex bivy bag, and then the sleeping bag that you're in as well. Casino de Long, I think that's what it's called. Uh, okay, this one came up three weeks ago. Can any of you guys recommend some of the good surplus stores to source kit from? I would say there are an awful lot out there. Google is your friend. I Googled it not too long ago and I recognised this company straight away. Okay, it's militaryfirst.co.uk. Militaryfirst.co.uk is one of the top suppliers here in the UK of military surplus equipment. Okay, it doesn't break the bank and it's free shipping to anywhere in the UK. So hopefully that answers that question for you. What size MSR cook pot are you using there, please, Nick? Okay, and this one's coming from Sean Gilbert. Uh, and that was three weeks ago. Okay, so Sean, I am using the Alpine 1.1 litre MSR. They go up to 1.6, but for it to fit into a side pouch of my Carrymore SF bag, I went for the 1.1, I fit all my food and bits and pieces inside there. Um, because it's a stowaway pot, everything can shut down really tightly in there. If you've got anything that you're worried about getting perished or, or you know, kind of um, rice or things like that that might spill out into your bag, I'd put them in that metal pot and that can sit in, in your side pouch. So that's pretty handy. Robert Kirk has asked, okay, um, I like to use a, pro a Prosec knot. So what he's talking about now here is we're looking at that video with the three essential knots for tarps, uh, camping or bushcraft. He said here that he likes to use a Prosec knot a loop and a snap gate at one end and then the vent knot at the other, okay? He said he's surprised that I use such a heavy rope um, as a ridge line. Is there a reason for that in that video? Yes, there is. And food tastes better in the outdoors, agree. And he loves the dog, uh, what, what is she? And don't say dog. Tilly, what are you? Come up here, tell, tell the people, what are you? Tilly is a fox red Labrador. Um, and she is my emotional well-being animal. She's my little doggy who I've had since she was nine weeks old. She's now five and she's very well disciplined um, and, 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 and an absolutely trusted friend. You use a prussic knot, um, yeah, absolutely fine. Anything that's gonna bite, bite, bite onto itself as it's so easy to do, yeah, agree. Loop and a snap gate at one end. Yeah, all good as long as you've got a snap gate. So the reason I use the knots that I do in that video, okay, including the figury four slippery sliding knot, is because I can't guarantee I've always got a, a, a snap gate carabiner or something like that with me. So I rely on the rope or string or whatever it is I'm using to bite down on itself but still be adjustable and I've built in the weakness to allow for mother nature because you'll never beat mother nature. Why have I used such a heavy rope? It's what was in the landy that day as I was off to go do the filming. Guys, I'm fitting in all these filming windows around running um, a, a busy everyday bushcraft company where I'm providing experiences, recreational uh, and educational uh, stuff in the outdoors with all kinds of groups, individuals, people, all kinds of stuff. So for that reason, sometimes the equipment will be what I've got to hand on the day of the race. Hidden Woods Ben has asked, cutting back on cheese? I'm sure you're kidding, else I'd have to unsubscribe immediately. Cutting back on cheese, just out of interest. Ever tried a big wool blanket? Okay, so he's got a 2.4 by 2.2, um, which even with his giant lower end, he can roll into uh, in double and the coldest he's used it down to was minus eight degrees and that was sufficiently comfortable. Wall blankets are very very cool, they're a, uh, a funky item and I think they have their own place uh, within the kind of bushcraft community. I tend to use modern synthetic fibres for sleeping inside, things like you know the sleeping bag or the military sleeping bag. A woolen blanket for me would be a bit of a test I would see that as a, I'm gonna take just a woolen blanket as my sleep system, uh, and I'm gonna go out there in the winter and I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, le learn how to lay yourself out and how to wrap yourself up in one of those. There's videos out there, if not, I'm probably gonna end up making one this winter uh, and sleep next to an open fire. But that said, if I had the choice between the wool blanket and the modern synthetic military sleeping bag, my money's here every single time. So this is a skill in itself. Uh, it requires a lot more presence of mind, administration, when to and how to apply it. You've got to look after that thing. You certainly don't want to be getting it uh, really wet. So you need to be able to, to think about, you know, the type of shelter you're going to use with that and how to, how to stop that from 
soaking up loads and loads of water, even though wool will keep you warm uh, whilst wet. But yeah, I think they're very cool is my answer and I would definitely use one again at some point. Is the British Army roll mat a good option for insulation? Well, we've already kind of covered that one. Okay, so that's Timothy Gawley. Yes, yes, it is very good. It's a cost effective option. Great vid, what do you think about fanny packs? I use a fanny pack for filming these videos when I'm out in the woods because once you've got your pack on and all the rest of it, to keep putting the pack down to keep getting new batteries out and changing over the GoPro, etc., it's easier just to have a clipped on fanny pack un up underneath your uh, your waist there. So short term use, short term sorties or, or little mini patrols or whatever, it can be quite useful to for, for quick and easy access for things like GoPro batteries. So that would be an instance where I would use a fanny pack. Right, Mr. Phil Crow. Two weeks ago, honest question, how would you go about drawing a pair of very wet wrapped socks whilst on exercise? Now this is quite a classic kind of old school soldering conundrum. In the field, I would always carry at least three, pa right, three pairs of socks. There'd be this, the pair of socks which are on my feet, which I'm actively going on, to, on patrol with, or I'm walking onto target with, or whatever it is. There would be uh, a pair which are usually, <laughs> usually, in a, in a pretty sodden state because we do the whole wet and dry system in, in the Royal Marines where um, you'll always have one, one nice dry uniform, one very wet, soggy uniform which you're normally actively using and drying out as you're on the move okay and then you're going to have a, a spare a spare kit somewhere. I'd have the kit that are on my, the ones that are on my feet are going to be as dry as I can possibly get them. I'm going to have another pair which are going to be probably equally sodden desperately trying to dry them out around my neck. Hear me out. And they're gonna have a dry pair in a bag somewhere that I'm trying to preserve and use uh, in, in the meantime of the drying process. So you will have seen in my video about military sleep systems, okay guys, you will have seen that the inner parts of some of the sleeping bags have like a mesh inside. So what I tend to do is as soon as my feet are wet at the first convenience, okay, uh, when we get to a halt or a stop or a harbour area or we go firm somewhere for any amount of time, first thing I'm going to do, even if I just get one sock back in the game, is I'm going to take those socks off and I'm going to wring them. And I might even use a mate to help me wring them as tight as I can possibly wring them. So they're going to get the old ring and swing. So I'm going to ring them, then I'm going to swing them in the air as much as possible. Okay, uh, obviously if, if, if tactically if I could do so back then. Obviously that's quite a bit of movement you're creating but in today's bushcraft scenario it doesn't matter. I'm going to go ahead and swing that sock and get as much water out of it as possible. Next thing I'd do especially with something like a, uh, I don't know if I'm wearing any, a uh, long black military sock is I'm going to tie the socks together in the middle. So I've got two black military socks and then I'm going to put them around my, around my neck okay uh, with my with uh, where, where all my body is producing lots of heat is coming out from here as I'm walking wherever it is I'm going okay so that heat is gently passing through the fibers along with the wicking act of the air around me so that's also helping to dry those socks out when we get to wherever we're going and we go firm for the night or whatever it is if I'm in that sleeping bag those socks will then be in the sleeping bag in the pouches with me also drying out it's a bit of a rotational nightmare you've got to have good foot admin and foot care. You've got to be powdering your feet. You've got to be using zinc oxide tape. You've got to be uh, on the ball with your blister and your protocol with how to look after your feet because at the end of the day, your feet are as important as your weapon. You can't really go anywhere or do anything without the other on the battlefield. From a bushcraft perspective, again, <laughs> you're not going to get very far on a bushcraft journey or a trip if you, if you go down on your feet and you can't administrate yourself. So look after those socks. Uh, find innovative ways to dry them out. So Mr. N7 Tigger has asked, um, finally, I've asked so many bushcraft channels directly, is it okay to wear a cotton shirt over wool or synthetic base layer? And what, what about a material? Is that say 30% cotton, 70% synthetic or 50-50? Uh, apparently nobody's ever bothered to answer. Well, look guys, uh, Mr. N7 Tigger, I do. I wear a cotton Hidden Valley Bushcraft logo t-shirt when I'm teaching groups, okay? Because it is visible and I, you can see that, you know, what my company is and what it does as its function. And it might be that I'm teaching in the winter, so I might very well have a merino wool base layer on and then I'll have my cotton 
uh, logo t-shirt over the top and then I'll probably have uh, especially if it is the winter something like a lambs wool jumper good quality woolen jumper after that recently I've been using the Nerona which is organic cotton as my outer which is really tightly woven and is and is a fantastic outer in fact if it was really harsh conditions I would probably swap out the Nerona if I'm going to be exposed to uh, high amounts of water and wind all day long, I would probably swap out to, to something more industrial, uh, more synthetic based, more of a kind of a mountain type jacket. But the Nerona so far has not let me down. The beauty about bushcraft is I'm not on an exposed mountainside. I'm in, I'm in woodlands and valleys, generally up to about sort of uh, 800 metres I'm doing all kinds of different stuff. There's always somewhere to take a bit of cover, to, to get a fire on, to get a warm brew down my neck, to uh, to make it even more a hot wet, or uh, or somewhere where I can administrate myself or stick a tarpaulin up and ride out the worst of it. So that's the beauty with what I do now, as I'm not having to stick myself out into the middle of the worst conditions ever and just suffer and grizz it out. So yeah, so I would say there's nothing wrong with cotton. You can have one of those, if you're doing something where you're moving light and quick over ground, okay, you're gonna want something that's gonna wick close to the skin uh, and, 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 stop, and stop you from getting, you know, kind of, if you're carrying stuff that's really, really heavy for huge amounts of periods of time, okay. Merino wool is great in cold conditions, but in, in, on a hot summer's day, you can start to clag up that wool quite quickly and it can get a little bit close to the skin. So then you're going to want something much more akin to uh, something with a high kind of synthetic polyester type content. The only problem is with that, it makes you smell like a footballer's jock strap. You'll have to work that out. Whether you're doing a one day, two day, three day, five day, Merino wool has the advantage because it's always going to be better as a base layer. But to answer your question, there's, there's nothing wrong with wearing cotton over the top. Uh, or, or closest to the skin. The expression cotton kills, okay, as long as you've got some wool to back it up, basically, is my answer. The last one of the day is going to be about, oh, here is a classic. Any tips for old, for those of us who are old enough to have a, to need to have a pee in the middle of the night? Okay, Mark, <laughs> Haverman, Havman, right, yes, Mark. The answer is, if you need a pee in the middle of the night, you're going to have to go for this reason. Once your body has produced that, that liquid has started to fill up in your bladder, okay, you're using body heat to be heating a body of liquid to keep it at your body temperature. It's sucking energy from you. Getting it gone is gonna be the fastest way to warming back up again, balanced against breaking the seal in your, your sleeping bag, having to get out in the middle of the night, quite possibly naked, have a wee. That's no joke in freezing conditions. So I don't know what conditions you live in, I don't know what country you're in or what terrain you're kind of um, kind of involved in, but I would say this, uh, consider a bottle, consider something that's flat packable, one of those, you know, it's like a bag, but with a, a nozzle, collapsible pee bag, okay, you could take with you. Uh, being a gentleman without being too crude, you could offer yourself to the edge of the, uh, the thing and then and do your business whilst you're still pretty much inside your sleeping bag, well, or maybe between sleeping bag and bivy bag, if you can't find a way to do the acrobatics to get everything down just far enough in your sleeping bag, you can kind of get just out of the side and we clean out the side of your, uh, your hammock. Okay, that is a viable option. To make life easier in the short term, use something with a really wide mouth to it, something like a fabric conditioner bottle, like, you know, one of the, I won't name any of those, high street brands but when guys are doing surveillance okay in my old world some of them keep a fabric conditioner bottle underneath the seat in their car uh, and they would uh, wee into the bottle i was i was reliably informed that this is a great way to uh, to go about not having to leave the vehicle and you can stay in the wagon then and stay looking and you know observing what it is you need to be observing so there you go hopefully that answers that question fabric conditioner bottle learn to do the acrobatics or find yourself one of those collapsible little um, plastic bag bottles as kind of space saver bottles. They're pretty handy as well. I would say that that's all the questions I've got for this week. That was our first ever Q&A. Thanks for watching guys. Please make sure you hit the like, subscribe and share button. Have a look through our cata uh, all our catalogue of different videos. And if you can come up with any questions, we'll be happy to answer them again. Uh, at some point we'll sit down and do another one of these. Okay, so from myself and Tilly Moo, it's bye for now, and uh, we'll see you all again soon.